Mr. Henty climbed out of the car, and Debbie pulled the door closed behind him and quickly locked it. She watched as he disappeared amongst the trees, and couldn't drag her eyes away from the place he had once been. Debbie would never willingly go into the woods of Avis. She heard the rumours, and the stories, and nursery rhymes. She knew about the poet who went mad after getting lost there, and whose whole family had been torn apart by tragedy he blamed on Avis. She knew the statistics. Not the exact numbers, of course, but everyone in the town knew they lived in an unusual place, with some of the highest rates of suicide, murder, and accidental death. It wasn't until the last few months that people started to disappear in such large numbers, but there had always been missing people. Some missing for years before showing up again somehow changed, twisted and different. Then they'd disappear again. Shannon leaned forward between the chairs and turned the engine off. Without the lights, they could no longer see out of the windows, their own faces reflecting back at them when they tried. It was eerily quiet. Both girls slowed their breathing until it was barely audible, and Mrs. Henty wasn't breathing anyway. The rain had slowed to a wet mist, but the occasional burst of thunder made them jump and cling to each other in the back seat. "'What if he doesn't come back?' asked Mrs. Henty. It was too dark to even see her, and she had her back to them still. Debbie didn't answer, and Shannon held tighter to her arm. A few minutes passed, and Debbie got used to the twisting sound of fabric, until she realised it was Mrs. Henty trying to wriggle out of her constraints. She tried to look out of the window for Mr. Henty, but made eye contact with herself and quickly looked away. No one in Avis was particularly keen on looking in the mirror. "'Whitney's only about twenty minutes down this road. We could go and get help and come back for him,' whispered Shannon with her eyes squeezed shut. "'We can't leave him. He brought us because we begged. We can't just steal his car.' "'What if he doesn't come back?' asked Mrs. Henty again, and this time it sounded like she was facing them, but they couldn't see her in the dark. "'He'll be back in a minute and we'll go. Mrs. Henty, please don't talk again till he gets back.' Debbie's heart was racing, and she started to feel the clammy, uncomfortable dampness of her clothes, and Shannon's clothes pressed against her. The windows had fogged up so that even if she could see out, she'd have to wipe at them first. She felt a claustrophobic desperation to get out of the car and out of Shannon's grip and Mrs. Henty's gaze. "'I need some air!' she gasped and plied Shannon's hands off her. "'Stay in the car!' gasped the younger girl as Debbie slammed the door closed on her and felt the cold, wet air on her face. It was a relief, like finally stepping out of a packed bus. She shook her arms and rolled her shoulders and looked back and forth at the road stretching out on either side of them. With the aid of the moon, she could see the grey tarmac on the road and the white lines, but the forest was a deep ocean of blackness. The night she had seen those girls in the woods was like a dream now, far away and hard to visualise or put into words. She hoped her night would soon be the same. The scurry of feet brought her back to her senses. She fell back against the car in terror as the silhouette of a girl came closer into focus. She was far away down the road, but moving quickly. Her gait was like that of an injured animal. She leaned to one side and dragged a leg behind her. Debbie got back in the car and locked the doors. Mrs. Henty had one hand free from her ties, and Shannon was crumpled in the corner of her seat with her hands covering her face. An almost inaudible sob bubbling on her lips like the ripples of a wave. Shh, 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 shh there's someone coming. Shannon sobbed louder, and Debbie tried to silence her by hugging her head and stroking her hair. With no lights on inside the car, it would be difficult for anyone to see in. Debbie prayed whoever it was had not seen or heard her, and might just pass by. Crumpled girl, so broken, so sad, said Mrs. Henty. Shh, Mrs. Henty, please be quiet. Two hands and a twisted face with bulging, maddening eyes suddenly pressed against the glass of Debbie's window and peered in. Her desperate breath fogged the glass immediately, and she moved to another spot. She fogged the glass again and moved again. The bloody girl with exposed bones that creaked like rusty doors was circling them like a shark. Mrs. Henty opened her mouth again to speak, and Debbie leaned forward, grasping her shoulder pleadingly. Their eyes met, and Mrs. Henty seemed to have a moment of clarity, in which she nodded and remained silent. "'Is that Shannon Bailey?' asked the creature, and Shannon flinched. She looked up from Debbie's shoulder, where she had been firmly hiding her face, and made eye contact with the broken girl. She was a few classes above Shannon at school. Nancy something. Do you want to come and play with me and your brother? He's in the church, won't you join us? She giggled before putting her elbow through the window and shattering glass over all three of them. Debbie pushed Shannon out of the opposite door and scrambled out after her. She opened Mrs. Henty's door and the broken woman fell onto the wet gravel with a thud, her one loose arm bent behind her back. Let's go, yelled Shannon as she pulled on Debbie's arm and Debbie tried to pull Mrs. Henty with them. Leave her! 
yelled Shannon, just as Nancy something came around the car and dragged Shannon down to the ground. She was spitting and growling as Debbie kicked her off and pulled the small group into the thicket of the trees and the terrifying darkness. Twigs snapped underneath their feet in an infuriating loudness that made it impossible to hide. All they could do was clumsily rush in a single direction, hoping that the predator on their tail was as lost in the darkness as they were. They soon felt the squelch of flooded ground and the rise of the water around their ankles. We'll drown, cried Shannon. If we have to swim in the dark, we'll drown. Debbie looked frantically around, desperate for her eyes to adjust to the deepening black all around them, like a universe without stars. She listened to the forest around them, and couldn't tell if the girl was on their tail, or if the trees were filled with approaching monsters. It was so loud, and her heartbeat added to the slew of sounds. "'What do we do, Debbie?' asked Shannon, but it sounded like she had drifted away from her. When Debbie said she didn't know, Shannon heard the distance between them two, and started to cry. The water of the flooded lake was up to their waists now, and Debbie heard the splashing of someone else in the dark approaching them. Would this really be the end of it all? To drown or be drowned in the weeping lakes, never to see Mr. Henty again, never to leave Avis? Suddenly another sound broke through the antagonistic noise, and Debbie turned to face its source. Only a few yards in front of them, a car with the lights on inside, and our house by madness blaring from the radio. She had to squint to adjust her eyes to the light but she was sure she saw it. Colin. He was in the driving seat smoking a cigarette that he passed over to Mark Bailey. He passed it back to Kevin, who had to roll up a baggy sleeve to take it. They were drinking cheap beer and laughing, turning up the radio. Mark! cried Shannon, who started to wade through the lake towards the car. The headlights showed Debbie where Mrs. Henty had drifted off to, and she quickly reined her in and dragged her along with them as they reached the now dark and empty car. Mark! cried Shannon looking around as if they'd hunched down behind the car, just playing a trick. They were never there, but they had been. They had shown them the car and guided them in the dark. The door was open and there was water inside, but at least it was a barrier between them and the outside and all the twisted evil of Avis. When they pulled the door closed behind them, the radio turned on again, this time Ghost Town by the specials, an apt message from the other side. We're not dying in Avis, we're surviving this.